condense uh, volumes of subject matter down into about 25 or 30 minutes. Take your time, brother. And we ask God to inspire us when we put pen to paper. We try to formulate a message that we would convey His word. Amen. 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 When you talk about family, you can go on and on and on and on. Amen. God blessed me with a larger family and my wife and I fulfilled our nuptials about a year or more ago. Last July, um, we celebrated recently our one year anniversary and uh, God gave to me a new family. Amen. But as I said, the months of, of July, August, and September, sometimes you, you have all over the country family reunions. People come together from all parts of the country to reunite with old family members and, and meet new family members and even see people that we hadn't seen in decades. I'm looking forward to that in my own family. So the timing of this month's theme is very apropos. The psalmist wrote, Behold how good it is, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The family is one of the most important cornerstones of human society. And as such, it should be nurtured, should be protected. There isn't a single solitary thing in this world that we love more than our family. Men, mothers, and fathers, our grandparents, Brothers and sisters, our children, aunts and uncles and cousins and extended families and blended families and in-laws and such. These are our physical, biological family. Sometimes uh, a dying relative would leave an inheritance to a certain family member, amen. Not just money or family heirlooms and things like that. But we inherit things that we don't want. <laughs> Diabetes. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Cancer. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We are victims, if you will, to our genetic line. When we inherit things, we might inherit my mama's eyes. Uh, my daddy's uh, mm -hmm. Flat feet. My, my daughter thinks that she inherited flat feet from me. My feet ain't flat. <laughs> right, Pastor. <laughs> but being a family, as Sister Tasha said, means something that you're, you're part of something that is very wonderful. It means you will love and be loved for the rest of your life no matter what, from fame. But more important than that is that God has made through Christ Jesus a spiritual Christian family. Amen. Spiritual or Christian families are not just family related by blood. Christian or spiritual family is related by the blood. Amen. The blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. A spiritual or Christian family is a family comprised of like-minded believers who recognize and accept and call upon the name of Jesus. Amen. We here are children of God. God's children. Bible fellowship. Amen. And, and, and of course, in the spiritual or Christian family, we call each other brothers and sisters. Yes. Sister Mary, yes. Sister Sandra, yes. Brother Alfred. Amen? Yes. Amen. And, and the defining characteristic of the spiritual Christian family is love. Yes. 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 A strong, loving, cohesive, physical, biological family it is a family that lines up with biblical principles 
and becomes this strong Christian spiritual family. Each member of the family, they understand and they accept and they fulfill their God-given roles. The family that prays together stays together. Amen. And the family is, is not an institution created by man. No matter what we think, we might think. The family was instituted and created by God for the benefit of man. Amen. Man has been given stewardship over the family. And even though family can get on your last nerve, All right. modern science says that the human brain has over 100 billion nerve cells. 100 billion nerve cells. And family can get on every last one of them. Amen. Family sometimes the ones that hurts us the most. But family are the ones that during times of trouble, they're going to be there for you. In most cases. Uh, I lived down the street from a family, and it was like 13 or 14 of them. And when you fought one of them, you had to fight all of them. Amen. And there was one little guy's name was Sweet Two Sam. He was a troublemaker in the neighborhood. He'd go around starting fights because he knew he had family backing him up. And he'd get into a fight, and here they come running, about 12 of them. Probably much the same as in pastor's family. It's a whole bunch of them. If you fought one of them, you had to fight them all. They don't call them the battles for nothing. <laughs> But consequently, the enemy has come in and he has attacked the family. Since from the very beginning, we're going to come back to that. But uh, nowadays, there, there are quite a few websites that people can go on and research their family histories. There's uh, Ancestry.com and and DNA.com, and they got another one, 23andMe.com, and you answer a series of questions about your, your, your uh, genealogical background. You send them a sample of your DNA, and they supposedly can determine your bloodline. Or even tell you from what race or ethnicity or group of peoples your genetic line comes from. Now, I'm not quite sure how far back they can go with any accuracy into your lineage uh, and what their findings, to some degree, just your physical, biological facts. That's all that they can determine what is or what was your physical, uh, biological family. But real talk, Brother David, they cannot give you your spiritual or your Christian history. Come on, come on. Your true bloodline yeah. comes from the blood of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. And, and we are all, as I said, we are all descendants of Abraham. Yeah. Come on, talk, talk. If you want to go back further than that, we're descendants of Noah. Right. If you want to go back even further than that, we are all descendants of the first family, yeah. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're Jew or Gentile. Black or white, Asian or Hispanic, we all come from the first family. Yes. The concept of the family is extremely important in the Bible, both in the physical or biological sense and, of course, in the Christian, spiritual sense. God's plan for creation was for man and woman to marry and to have children. A man and a woman would form a one flesh union through marriage. And they, with their children, become the family. The family is the essential building block of human society. Yeah. The concept of the physical, biological family was introduced in the very beginning in the Bible. In, in Genesis 1.28, the Bible says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful. Increase in number. Fill the earth. In forensic genealogy, as far as the physical, biological family goes, 
uh, biblical family, there are two books in the Old Testament that deal largely with the ancestry and the family lineage of the patriarchs. It, get a chance to read Chronicles, and it's a hard read. Just being able to pronounce some of the names and some of the places that it talks about in the book of, of Chronicles, it's a difficult read. But it always tells you, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who had 12 sons and two daughters by 12 wives and so on and so on and so on. And, and the, the book of Chronicles tells us how those patriarchal families grew and how they perpetuated. It tells us in biblical times that families were very close-knit. I remember a pastor preached a sermon about Abraham and, and, and all of his descendants and how dysfunctional they were. I mentioned that we all are descendants of Abraham, amen. There's an old saying, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. The pastor talked about how dysfunctional Abraham's family was, but we're going to talk about, we're going to try to delve into other aspects of God's covenant and promise to Abraham and his family. And we will see that despite that dysfunction, God sealed his covenant and he fulfilled his promise and he rewarded Abraham for his faithfulness. Now, you might hear me say uh, or use these names interchangeably. Abram and Abraham. But they are in fact one and the same. They're the same person, right? We know that after some time, God changed Abram's name to Abraham. But forgive me if I say Abram or Abraham, we're still talking about the same person. In our scripture, in Genesis 15, 1 and 6, and I'm just going to read it again real quick because it was kind of brief. Uh, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars. And if you are able to number them, and he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. In demographics, the world population is about 7.5 billion people. 7.5 billion people uh, live in the world today. And there are billions more who have lived and died throughout human history. But all the races of the human existence stem from the physical, biological line of Abraham. It was at night when God told Abraham to go outside and try to count the number of the stars, and he told them, so shall your descendants be. You ever sat outside on a beautiful, clear night and saw how starry it was out and, and just looked up and gazed into God's great, infinite creation and, and looked at the stars and <coughs> tried to count them? There are Billions and billions of stars. It's impossible to count them all. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, has a hundred billion stars, and there are billions and billions of other galaxies with billions and billions and billions of stars. It's virtually impossible to count them all. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham 
to make his descendants as many as the stars that fill the night sky. Whoa. The Bible tells us that God knows how many stars there are. Amen. Yeah. And the Bible said, God counts the number of the stars and he calls them all by name. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that, that is an awesome, awesome feat. Just give it a moment of contemplation. Take a thimble full of sand. Just a thimble full of sand. And spread it out on the table. And try to count each grain. Better yet, try to give each grain a name. That's how awesome and how mighty and how powerful my God is. Amen. Abraham is, is often called the father of all nations. Yeah, come on. In Thank fact, the name Abraham means father of many nations. And, and if we're to study Abraham's lineage or his family line from him, we get a better understanding of our own Ancestry.com. When, when, when Pastor preached about how dysfunctional Abraham's family was and how that dysfunction was perpetuated through his immediate family, down through the ages, through his sons and grandsons and great grandsons and all their families. I was, I was reminded when he preached that sermon that more often times today, we find many highly dysfunctional families. But the key to reconciling dysfunctional families is that we turn to the Word of God. Yes. Talk about it. Abraham's family, they, they might have been a little cray cray. Yes. But Abraham loved his family. Yes. And they was real tight. Remember when Abraham went to go rescue his son Lot? Yeah. Uh, not his son, but his nephew. Went to go rescue his nephew Lot. And the Bible tells us it's in Genesis 14, 14. Now, when Abraham had heard that his nephew was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house. Abraham had a big family, immediate and extended and blended, because he had 318 trained servants who was born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them and attacked them by night. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back Lot and his brother and his goods and, and then all the women and all the people. Abraham was well in age when God entered into several covenants with him. Because of Abraham's faith and because of Abraham's obedience, God continued to bless Abraham. Blessed his descendants despite their dysfunction even through to this very day as we are descendants of Abraham and we are highly dysfunctional but we still continue to get blessed by God each and every day, each and every moment whether we realize it or recognize it or not. When God called his, uh, Abraham and his family out of his hometown he called him and his family. The sign of the Abrahamic covenant was circumcision to all the male children born into that household. Um, even the servant staff. And, and in other words, God's covenant with Abraham was familial. It was about the family. God promised Abram that he would make from him many nations. Abraham was was elderly when God blessed him with children, the Bible says in Genesis 17.1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. God blessed Abraham's family with a genealogical anointing. Meaning that God would continue to bless his family line down through the years. And he established the bloodline of the spiritual family through Christ Jesus and through all posterity. 
here is how, despite Abraham's family's dysfunction, God blessed Abraham with innumerable amount of physical and biological family. Abram had two sons. He was 86 years old when his firstborn, Ishmael, was born to his wife, Sarai, maidservant, Hagar. Now, Hagar mocked Sarai because Sarah couldn't have children. But Hagar was subsequently ostracized. She was disenfranchised. She was kicked out of the family. She was kicked out of the home. And when Hagar was wandering in the wilderness with her son, God appeared to Hagar and told her to return to the household. Submit yourself to Sarah. And, 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 and then God goes on to tell Hagar in Genesis, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for a multitude. So God's promise and God's covenant is already being fulfilled through that firstborn Ishmael. Many historians and theologians believe that Ishmael is the father of Islam. Billions and billions of Muslims around the world, amen. So God's promise is fulfilled to this very day, already through Abraham's firstborn. The Bible says that Abraham was 100 years old when his wife Sarah, who was 90 years old, gave birth to Isaac. Remember the story of Isaac? Yes. Isaac is the one that Abraham took on to be sacrificed. And there in the bush was a ram. Isaac had two sons, twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger brother, stole Esau, his older brother's birthright. They was dysfunctional. <laughs> Jacob had 12 sons and at least one daughter with four different women. They was dysfunctional. If you go back and read the story, we see that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And the promise God made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, told in the Bible, continues to perpetuate. Because even today, the Bible says that the 12 tribes of Israel will inherit the new covenant. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons are the 12 tribes that the Bible tells us about in Revelation that will inherit the the new covenant, or the covenant that was already given to Abraham way back in the day. I wasn't supposed to go there. That was something different. That was a side point. But because of the spiritual strength of Abraham and how the family was bound to God through a spiritual covenant, through a genealogical anointing, God continued to bless them. Why? Because the Bible says the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. To those who fear him and his righteousness from children to children. Abraham's story of his physical, biological family and their failings and, and their shortcomings and quite frankly, their sins is a result of the enemy's many attacks on the family. As I said, I'm going to come back to this. The enemy has always concentrated his attack of mankind by attacking first the family. He has attacked the heart of the family from the very beginning. He has always tried to drive a wedge between family members, wreak havoc on the family, fracture the family. Today's story is no different. Satan has come in and fractured our families. He breaks us apart separates us. And if our families are fractured in masses, we will have fractured communities. We will have a fractured educational system. We will have a fractured government and a fractured nation and a fractured world. Sociologists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, they all call, uh, all these so-called family experts wrote many books on the dynamics of the family. 
But the Word of God, the Bible, is the only guidebook on reconciling dysfunctional families. All right. It is the SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, for how man should be good stewards of the physical, biological family that God has blessed us with. How husbands should love and treat their wives. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The Bible is our SOP as far as a man goes in his role in the leadership of the family. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Bible tells us as an SOP what man's responsibility is to provide for his family. 1 Timothy 5, 8, the Bible says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Bible is a, a guidebook for wives and mothers. In Ephesians 5, 22, the Bible tells, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. In Isaiah 49, 15, the prophet asks, Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child that she has born? The Bible is an SOP for even how children should comport themselves in the circle of the family. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. As, as disrespectful as kids are today, a lot of them better be glad we live under grace. Because if we were still under the law, the Bible says in Exodus he who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Wow. They better be glad we live on the ground. That's where the old saying comes from. I bought you in this world, I'll take you out. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just examine for a moment the spiritual concept of family. During his three-year ministry, there was an occasion when, when Jesus uh, was, was in a crowd, and, and this is being found in Matthew 12, 46. While Jesus was still talking to a crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, I, I, I want to make sure there's no misconceptions about this passage. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus is not saying that the, the physical or biological family is not important. That's not what he's saying. He's, mis he's not dismissing his mother or dissing his siblings. What he's doing is he's trying to make a clear theological point that in the kingdom of heaven, come on, talk about it. The most important family connection is spiritual, yeah. not physical. Yeah. It is the love we have for Jesus that binds the spiritual Christian family. Yeah. Jesus also said, "If you love your father or mother more than me." You're not worthy of me. If you love a son or a daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. The importance of the spiritual Christian family can also be found in the Mosaic Covenant. In the two of the Ten Commandments deal with maintaining the cohesiveness of the family. The fifth commandment regarding honoring parents is meant to preserve the authority of the parents and, mm -hmm. and family matters. Mm -hmm. And the seventh commandment, prohibiting, pro pro prohibiting adultery, protects the sanctity of marriage. Right. So we also see all, uh, early on that 
family members, we are to look after one another. Amen. When God asked Cain, where is Abel? Your brother. Cain's response was flippant, defensive, standoffish. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am my brother's keeper. 